weathered brown door. The number reads 20. Something smells good. Soup à l'oignon. The lieutenant motions to you to go ahead and knock. This is the door. You already know it's the right door. This is going to be so hard. You're right. It's still this true. You hear some light footsteps and what appears to be a daily weather forecast playing on the radio. We have our first preliminary identification. In all likelihood, the deceased is the husband of Billy Mejean. We need to confirm this, as well as deliver the death notification to Billy herself. Now, delivering a death notification is never an easy task. There's a reason why it's often called the most stressful part of our job. This is why it's usually done in pairs. You got this. I'll be monitoring reactions, ready to act if necessary. Dad, just don't say that you know how they feel. You don't. Good advice. The lieutenant motions towards the door. And someone turns down the radio. He gives you a short, encouraging nod. Tidying up, nervously, there's fear in her voice. It's you, from the book stand. Did you come to bring my cockatoo back? I don't think I introduced myself properly. I'm Billy. Would you like something to drink? Tea? Lemonade? We're out of coffee. The lieutenant has taken off his foggy glasses and is busy cleaning them in his handkerchief for now. You're on your own here. He must feel vulnerable without his glasses. Is this why he's letting you take the lead? Is this about Victor, my husband? Is he in some kind of trouble again? I can come pick him up in the station if that's what. Keep it together. You don't want your body language to tell her the news. Sorry, I'm rambling. It's just that Victor often gets into all kinds of trouble. So, how can I help you? How about some small talk before you break the news? It's me, Victor, and the kids here. We have two daughters, Jenny and Jolie. The girls are staying at their friend's place tonight. And Victor is... out. She swallows visibly. He has a problem with drinking. And so he disappears every now and then. He's probably in the parks drinking with his friends. I sent him to the library a few days ago, but I guess something came up. His old leather jacket. Um, it's just your average brown leather jacket, but he bought it as a teenager, so... It reminded him of his teenage years. Yes. The lining is hand-sewn. It's blue. I tried to make the thing more weatherproof since he's running around with it in the middle of winter. She folds her hands across her chest. I don't want to. I don't want to do this. Say what? Officer. Too late. You ruined it. Just... Say it now. Excuse me? What? What did you say? 
She's in pain. She's in so much pain. And so are you. Your chest is burning. We are very sorry to inform you, but your husband, Victor Mejean, was found dead this morning on the Martinez boardwalk. Oh. Oh. But he was just... He was just here. Alive. I understand that this comes as a huge shock. I want you to know that me and my partner are here for you if you have any questions. We are very sorry for your loss, ma'am. What happened to him? Tell me! Why? It's that bad? It looks like he slipped on the boardwalk, fatally, I'm afraid. It was just a very unfortunate accident, although alcohol may have played a role. And you just found him there? Lying in the cold? How long had he been there? She doesn't reply. Her eyes well up with tears as she struggles to keep it together. You hear the clock ticking in the children's room. Is there anyone we could call for you? A friend, a family member, someone who could be here for you? No, no. I just need to tell my girls. Unreal. God. Should I call them? Should I tell them to come home? All right. I'll call them. Just tell me, what do I need to do next? Where is he? Can I see him? For God's sake, lie. And who should I contact? He was taken to the city morgue. The local coroner will be contacting you shortly to arrange the funeral. Here's his number, in case you want to contact him earlier. Is there anything else that the RCM could do for you? No, I'll call you if something comes up. I'm still a bit... A brain condition. Again, if there's anything we could do for you, then don't hesitate to call the RCM, ma'am. She just nods, distant and inconsolable. The bed springs rattle beneath her as she begins to shake. I'll take it from here. Thank you. We should step outside and talk. So, the death notification. He's avoiding your gaze. This is the time to say how sorry you are about how things went. It's alright, don't worry about it. I'll call the station when we're finished with the day, and let them know the name of the deceased. That's it. We should get back to our case. There's nothing more we can do here. There's not much we can do for them anymore, I'm afraid. And, officer, I've seen worse. This wasn't the worst I've seen, okay? Now let's go. I really have, he thinks. She was strong. She made it easy for us. This door is made of metal and a... Secured to the doorframe with a safety chain, an unpaid energy bill is attached. 
threatening to cut off the electricity. It's addressed to Mr. Uno Doroita. And the place comes with three months' worth of utility bills. No response. The apartment numbers have fallen off the door, leaving the panel with a sticky one shaped shadow and a marker drawn two. You'll need to equip the chain cutters to enter. Snip right through the metal. A shabby door hangs oddly on its hinges. It should be easy, but it's just an awkward angle. Okay, the door doesn't really open wide enough to really get the cutters through. You can't get the leverage you need. And the cutters are blunt. And the chain is just super strong, okay? It's not your fault you can't cut it. Fabric rustles. The lieutenant's chin catches against his collar. He is looking on shaking his head in disappointment. Trouble with the chain, officer? Supreme titanium? Sure. The door inside this complex has super hard, super expensive chains. You can't stand for that. Come on, show him what you can really do. Snip. So much for that goddamn chain. The links fall to the ground on the other side of the door. You have bested the titanium menace. I know there's no stopping you, but let's at least make this quick. phone book lies open on the table, covering a stack of utility bills. Right next to it, in plain sight, sits a small bottle of amphetamine, conveniently equipped with a straw. Good. Confiscate it. The minuscule amount of amphetamine doesn't interest the lieutenant in the slightest. He listens instead to something in the other room. He pocket the bottle as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Socks even. In the dark, it looks like a nest. Mm -hmm. Something underneath there is breathing. It's not too late. No one's going to blame you for backing out. You don't have to do this. Just get out. Your hand touches a greasy duvet covered in cigarette burns and ketchup stains. You hear a growl. There is something alive underneath it. It's deep, in suffering somehow. You see a 60-year-old, fat, red-headed man passed out from large amounts of alcohol and God knows what else. The smell of shit rises from his mouth. You don't have to take him down. He's already down. I'm afraid it is. Look, it moves. And look, the other foot is camouflaged by a striped sock bearing the name Max Tor on the sole. Three toes are poking out of a hole. Max Tor is a gas company. He's wearing free socks from a gas company. They probably came with the bills. A groan rises from the man's throat, dry like a death rattle. He's trying to say something in his sleep. Well, 
Judging by the color of his hair, I would say yes, it is. The lieutenant's right. The man's unwashed hair bears a familiar ginger tone. Even the hair on his chest is coppery. The light from the window falls into his half-open eyes. No, it really doesn't. This looks very hard to recover from. This man won't be feeding his family anytime soon. Not that he was, but... At least he won't be beating his son. A pair of half-open bug eyes is staring back at you from the dark, empty, and frozen. It's clear that the person behind them is not awake. Can't you tell? It happens to exceptionally committed substance abusers. They fall asleep with their eyelids still open. Not a pretty sight. Look, he's trying to communicate. What is there to do? We could turn him on his side so he doesn't choke on his own vomit, but he's already on his side. We could take him to Remedy or Saint Baptiste, but he doesn't have money for medical services. The arms sauce would turn him down. They don't do charity for people who are trying to kill themselves. Besides, he'll be dead in a few. Years, months, weeks, the pile of blankets grunts miserably. Silence, only heat emanates from the sleeping body. The man groans once again, but his tongue keeps failing him. It's impossible to make out the syllables. A hand emerges from the blankets, trying to gesticulate something, and then falls back again, limp and defeated by sleep. A loud snore escapes his mouth. So you wield that can? Sweet graffito action, pig! Kuno likes that delinquent shit! Kuno's parties! You're just shit at life! Now what's your case with Kuno? Alright, so you got Kuno's kilo. Here is how we do it. First, you give Kuno Kuno's kilo, then Kuno gives you half back. That's how we split it. It's the best way, street way. Where down the street is? You sent your little friend in dressed as a hooker? Distraction style? That's some sick shit. Kuno wants to hear... Not a single muscle moves on the lieutenant's face. Kuno knows what Kuno means. Kuno means Graham. Wow, that's heavy. There you go. More than half in there. Kuno's fucking honourable like that. There is no movement on the lieutenant's face as he stares intently at the trash container. Now tell me, how the fuck are you still alive, pig? Yeah, so fucking what? Fuck are you talking to Kuno about that kiddie shit? 
Kuno knows it's fucking lame. That's why Kuno changed it. You can't fuck with Kuno. Yeah, you do some sambo shit, sneak in. Is the hooker thing real? The lieutenant flashes you a sharp look, but doesn't say anything. Only his tightly closed lips betray the effort keeping silent takes him. Fuck out of here! Kuno made that shit up to demean you. Look, pigs. Kuno gets it. You don't want to talk about it. Close quarters combat shit. Kuno doesn't want to talk about it either. Combat trauma shit. Wah! His posture changes. The swaying rooster motion stops for a second. Then he gets it going again. Reorienting himself. Fuck right. Kuno's dad was sleeping like a bum. Kuno told you. Kuno's dad doesn't give a shit about anything. Fucking breaking and entering shit. That's nothing to Kuno's dad. You got lucky, pig. Kuno knew this. Kuno's fucking violent fiend dad's been drinking hard lately. Kuno knew you have a way in. Narrow window. Kuno window. Kuno's not fucking trying to be tough. This shit is real. Kuno's fucking violent dad's gonna be a vegetable. Kuno knows that shit. Stroke shit. Stomach fucked up and... Kuno's gonna go out like that too. Gonna be just like Kuno's violent dad. Speed shit. Crime shit. Fucking on the bed. Go out West Revishaw style. Stop saying all this sad shit, Kuno. There's a touch of grief in there. Fuck are you talking, sad? <laughs> Kuno's got hard shit, death shit, nothing shit. Get your fucking nun ass out of here before Kuno fucks it dead. You think cause you brought Kuno one gram of speed, your friends now? Turn into... Kuno ain't turning into shit. Kuno is... Kuno is that shit. Kuno won! Oh, you won, Kuno! The fuck do you know about Kuno's life? Kuno's got plans. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, we got plans. Fuck right there were. Fucking three years or some shit. Yeah, that's right. Kuno's dad doesn't give a shit about that electricity and light shit. Just wants to pound on people and drink. Fuck that shit. Kuno's gonna move underground. There I am shit. Ancient shit. Kuno's gonna live in a fucking catacomb. Yeah, in a tomb, Kuno. Yeah, pig. This shit is done. Now get the fuck out of Kuno's face. Kuno needs to drop the bomb. Kuno doesn't fucking care. The trap stands empty amongst the reeds. No insect sounds or movement around. Only the reeds, melancholy rustling. Rain drips from the netting of the trap. Fantastic. 
The locusts, dazed from being transported, slowly begin to acclimate to their new surroundings. They're not really going to get the chance to get comfortable here. Good, now that's done. When do you think we will return to our impending apocalypse of a murder investigation? Don't answer that. It was a rhetorical question. He doesn't want to. But if there is one more cryptozoological runaround, he must force the investigation back on track. This better be it. Our tenant, the policeman. I hope the waves don't keep you up at night. What can I help you with? Nay, I haven't seen anyone lately. This is my little cinder block town. I know what goes on around here. She's being evasive. She knows something. There was a murder in Martinez. She might be a suspect. We would appreciate your help. Would you now? I know how this world works, and it doesn't work when people tell on each other. Ah, I should have known. This is yet another Union mess. I'm not afraid of them, you know. We are not in the habit of being afraid around here. There's not much to tell. People come and go. Now, was there something else? I see, ma'am. I hope you don't mind if we look around anyway. You should look around your shack. Maybe she's rented it out to others too. As you look at the floorboards in this corner of the shack, it's clear one of them isn't quite level with the others. The edge of a floorboard next to it looks scratched. Hollow space underneath the floorboards is dark and damp. You can barely make out the mixture of sand and sawdust below. Nothing particular catches your eye. Looks like more reeds. There might be something hidden inside the sand though. Something bad. Someone's night thoughts, a last resort, a bad idea. You stick your hand in and start combing through the sand. Dry, not like outside. Fine dust. And then, something hard wrapped in paper. A small cylindrical object. You pull it out. A bullet. A 9 millimeter bullet, to be exact. Fit for all muzzle loaders of that caliber. Like your own Villiers pistol for example. The floorboard doesn't care, but maybe the washerwoman does. You have enough to confront her with. It's extra ammunition. She's locked and loaded, ready to fight some cops. Holding the bullet, you get the feeling this isn't ammunition against you. It's for herself. Anti-object task force. Behold, the Anti-Object Task Force has assembled. God's Avenging Angel, arrayed against the lower emanations of the Darkened One. Shoe racks, tape recorders, motor carriages, and doors. So many doors. You're not just pounding it all to pieces. You're reforging the universe, from the anvil of the heavens to the worms below. Indulge in it. Be bold. Have an impact on the shape of creation. Out of the furnace of your rage, a new reality. Also, you should trash your room again.
An old mirror hangs. This idiocy has gone on far too long. Our tenant, the policeman. I hope the waves don't keep you up. Damn that girl. And without anger, a long and harsh life has taught her not to buckle under pressure. But it? You didn't put it there, did you? She did. Gone and hid things in there? She's usually a good tenant, and not a stupid one either. Yes. I let my room to that ruby girl. As I've done before when she's been in trouble or just looking for solitude. I've made it clear. We welcome all kinds of people here. She came last Friday, left on Monday in a hurry. What has she gotten herself into, that girl? She seems genuinely worried about her previous tenant. She's seen her hiding out from trouble before, but this seems different. That's for the police to find out. Right there, please answer each question to the best of your ability. I'm sure we have a few. Yes, early with the dogs, around 8 o'clock, I think. I cleaned it, like I always do. No. The truth, sire. She's good company, knows how to talk to an old woman. At my age, you don't get a lot of quality conversation, so I really appreciate that about her. Did she talk to you much during her last day? No, she was mostly silent this time, kept to herself. She tried not to let it show, but I could tell she hadn't come to fish. Usually she likes to cross a few lines. But this time, she mostly stayed in her room. How would I know? She's a gruff one, but not violent. She doesn't go around toting a gun. You could ask her about your hunch, that it was a desperate measure. See if she thinks Ruby fits the bill. I do tell. Exit from what? The lieutenant stops writing for a moment. He looks at you, then at the old woman. No, she's a fighter. She really believes that. Nothing of the sort. Sure, she was no stranger to the bottle. She fit in that way. But I only knew her to have a beer on the beach while watching the sunset. She isn't what you call a drunk, even offered me some from time to time. Said it was part of the communal life, but I never saw her lose control of herself, the way some people do. Not that I knew of, though she was into nice music. She once showed me a few mixtape millions she'd made. Although I guess she was pretty handy with the mechanical and technical stuff. Even fix the heater in the shop. You should be thankful for that. She may simply have kept the equipment elsewhere. I don't know. Further up the coast, she tried to leave quietly, but the hinges on that door screeched like a cat in heat. Woke me up. I heard her rushing in those heavy boots, heading up north. It's a peninsula. She might be trapped. You'll never find her, you know. She knows the coast like the back of her head. You only just arrived. I wouldn't worry about that, man. We are persistent. Are you sure you would rather stay here? Get a nice cozy fire going in the heater? Seems like a better idea to me. No, you can do it. You still have plenty of juice in you before you drop. Behind the cinder block houses, old pre-war ruins rise to the sky like dark palaces. The wind 
What more do you want to know about that poor girl? Yes, let's hear those other questions. One thing, officer. If you do find her, please go easy on her. She really means it. It's an honest plea. She's a good girl. Whatever she's gotten herself mixed up in. bright mural towering above you. The signage has peeled off over the years, but you can still make out Feld Electrical R&D. A slogan used to intertwine with the loops a long time ago. Now only a shadow of peeled letters remains. It says, tomorrow is just a whisper away. Looks like tomorrow never came. Above the mural, a collapsed roof, broken windows set in walls that are cracking and will soon also fall, and the coastal breeze rustling and sighing in the remains of the edifice. Feld Electrical. How ironic. All these dark rooms. There's something in the wind. Sometimes the only way to go forward is to fail first. Maybe we could, you know, ask the man who's pointing at the building? In there? She could. Or she could be in the identical room over there, or in that boat shack. In that church tower, maybe. And Mikael noticed the windows, especially with how there are no windows on the south side. This was to deal with. You officers, come to investigate the historic subtext of West Martinez? I'm Tran Heilostam. You must be Kim Kitsuragi, right? I was just telling my son about this building. Not a lot of people realize the historic significance here. Very rich in hypertext. Nice to meet you. Yes, hypertext. Young Carp and the collection of cultural hyperlinks. Oh yes, so Mikhail. They had to deal with monitor glare, especially in the summer. They still had vector monitors back then. That was 49 years ago. So they didn't have windows on the south wall. No, I can't say that we've met before, but I've heard of Kim, of course. Mikhail, say hi to the officers. Mikhail's a little tired today. We spent all night trying to run Orbis on his radio computer. Have you heard of it? It's a programming language used in Grad. Quite tricky, but he wanted to play this Grad-made adventure program. We've been getting really into worms lately. The man speaks in the artificial cadence of a professor, or someone who's been on too many radio shows. But I assume you're not here for giant worms when there are so many real things to see. Just as I was telling Mikael before, this is where the Coalition landed in 08. We could be standing on what is the most interesting landmark in Revachol West. This man is your half-brother. You feel it. But why? Well, get a load of this guy. He really enjoys his trivia. The Orbis programming language was named after its inventor, Victor Orbis, a cybernetician from Grad. They run Vox in the Occidental countries. No, I'm afraid I can't help you with this one, officer. It's just a regular day off for me and Mikhail here. So you haven't seen anyone around? No, I'm sorry. As I said, this is just a day off. We just arrived anyway. There's something friendly and familiar in how he says that. A day off. He's telling the truth. He hasn't seen anyone. Aha! But it's not just any empty old building. What not a lot of people know is, this used to be the R&D department of Felt Electrical. And Felt, 
which now sells ink cartridges mostly, was once a top dog in the turn of the century cybernetics boom. It looks old and weathered, with seagulls picking apart its stone and metal carcass. Bushy undergrowth has taken hold of the collapsed rooftop. Some kind of bird has set up a nest on a broken windowsill. That's not surprising. Only a vestigial ink cartridge and ferrotape manufacturer remains. They started out as a midway electronics outfit in Königstein two centuries ago. After an aggressive move to Revachol, Feld became a global player in the emerging personal electronics market of the pre-revolutionary era. Still, Tricentennial was beating them in business machines. But Feld had an ace up their sleeve. Or should I say, they were developing an ace up their sleeve. I'm mixing my metaphors here. It was here in Martinez, possibly in this very building, that they developed prototypes for a tape computer. Mm -hmm. An elegant folding mechanism of rollers and ferrotape ribbons, portable enough to be a take-it-home solution. Revolutionizing business machines, possibly even bring them to the average consumer, which is a feat of engineering even today's giants, Rehm, ICN and Zam, haven't achieved yet. He assumes something like a combat stance, facing the wind. Indeed. What? The revolution! Unfortunately, their moonshot project never made it to the market. Feld's move to Revachol backfired. The revolutionary government liquefied their assets and expropriated those very advanced prototypes. Possibly from this very building, or one of the adjacent ruins. All of this was built by Feld, even a boardwalk. While Pines built Martinez proper as a resort for their middle management, Feld built this side of town for R&D. Yes, they even built a pleasure wheel, but that got destroyed in the war. A pleasure wheel? Perhaps reminded of a childhood memory. It's clear he would prefer there were a big wheel lighting up the coast. Yes, to lure in their star engineers. This part of Martinez was nothing but reeds before Feld arrived. They had to make the prospect of living here attractive. It was supposed to become a global center for innovation in cybernetics. But history had other plans. Oh, I'm afraid it didn't end well for the boys. But this story is a bit too dark for little Mikael here. Now, if you were to ask about tape computers... Wait, is he saying that we should just bypass the excesses of the revolution? Tape computers. They used them for military communications, but also to write and send out press releases, the most notorious example being Le Decret de Mars. What's the Mars Decree? I mean the radio transmission sent out to news agencies and world governments by the newly created Commune of Revachol on the 7th of March in the year 02. A short-lived legislative foundation for a short-lived utopia. It's a beautiful piece of text, actually. A singer-songwriter I know, Charette, called it a love poem to River Shawl on her political concept album, Bombesir d'Ansolint. You should read it. Every local library in River Shawl stocks a copy of the decree. I tried to get Mikhail to memorize it. Tried to. Someone was much too interested in worms to be paying any attention. The kid takes a peek at the green and silver worm on the cover of the book. Already forgetting about this part of the discussion. Actually, no one knows. No one even knows what a computer made entirely of tape would look like. But word has it, they were very elegant, exquisite, alien-looking, turn-of-the-century hardware. Buckle up. Ten years ago, I did a little... freelancing, I guess you could say. I was a special consultant for an exhibition at the Womty Domty Dom Center in Vredefort, Oranje. It raised the same questions, and we had lengthy discussions with Paul Ockerman, who was head curator at the time. This was before the twins Keith and Guy Jews joined the team, trying to... Wait, did he just say Womty Domty Dom Center? He did it. He said Womty Domty Dom Center, like it's the most natural thing in the world. What the hell is a Wompty Dompty Dom Center? And who the hell are Keith and Guy Yost? 
the Wompty Dompty Dump Center for Contemporary Arts. The exhibition itself drew on Lagerman's notion of memory, and so there were some parallels. That's why the head curator, Paul Ackerman, chose to... <laughs> in fact, I'm not. The Wompty Dompty Dump Center is a place you can visit if you're ever in Vredefort and are ever in the market for an exhibition space slash contemporary art research center. <clears throat> but perhaps I should return to the tape computers. As I was saying, the device itself was very elegant, fragile even. One could write directly on the tape using a special chemical solution. The machine would then analyze the handwriting, perform operations and project output onto a white screen. It was a beautiful, delicate thing. Made of black film and folding tape structures. Even one would be very useful. Though I understand the socio-economic causes of the revolution, it pains me to imagine the revolutionary setting fire to the precious device. But so they did. The felt playback experiment vanished into the fires of 07. Yes, the official name of the prototype. Some sources report it as the felt playback experience, but those are incorrect. Who knows? Maybe it was an accident, or maybe they didn't want the technology to end up in the wrong hands. Either way, they're all gone now. All three versions of the prototype. Nothing but debris and ashes remain inside that building. But of course, <laughs> what else? I do have some money, yes, but that's not what's really important here. He's not gonna give you money. What are you doing? Clearly you were just profiling. No, I mean, come on, you need the money. If it's not a thing, he can give you some. Of course, Detective, I wouldn't have assumed anything else. Matter of fact, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the Vespertine Department of Justice has published a rather interesting paper on the criminal profiling in former socialist states. Have you read it? If not, then you definitely should. If not for tips and tricks, then just for theoretical curiosity. Anyway, that's just a little something that sprang to mind. You were saying? No, thanks to you for having me and little Mikael here to pick your brain. A very interesting conversation indeed. Pick your brain? If anything, this was rather one-sided. He did the talking. Whatever. The greatest Browsing through the... Your educational survey is done. Did you catch any of that? Imagine... Oh yeah, this is what I was made for. Correct. As the first question two. Easy. Everybody... Correct. Franco... Question three. Got it under control. Correct. The most final... I've got it. Honest. Correct. Everything. Congrats. An A. You really never get it some. The edges of the page. The jacket. He is ambushed by a truck. You open the book to a random page. His arm. It calls out to you. This is. Berserker rage burns in his azure hued eyes as he brings glory. Man from Hyamdal rides on a gilded griffin. The steel muscles of man from Hyamdal. A passage reads. The men thine spells are no I have grand plans for you, man from Hyomdal. She gestures. What do you even know about literature? Have you ever read a book in your life? Write a thesis. Man from Hyomdal is done with you. The precarious world. How not to lose. It is impossible not to. The world is balanced on the edge of a knife. It's a game of frayed nerves. You're pushed on by numbers and punitive measures. Pain, rejection, and unpaid bills. You can either play, or you can crawl under a boat and waste away. Turn into salt, 
or a flock of seagulls. Your enemies would love that. Or you can fight. The only way to load the dice is to keep on fighting. The once bright mural towers above you. Even though you're sure you succeeded, all is quiet. There is no cold hand brushing against your forehead, no rustle in the reeds. The wind has died down. The ruin in front of you is silent as a tomb. Trying to talk to the wind, the city, whatever you thought would happen, did not. And now you're just standing there with your hands fallen to your side. A prayer of sorts to Revishol. How do we? I was really hoping she'd be in the village. <sighs> okay. She's probably north of the village, and this place is a peninsula. We already scanned most of the outdoor areas on our wild cryptid hunt, so we have an understanding of the geography, at least. And then there's the church. We've already searched that and can rule it out. I know it doesn't feel like progress, but exclusion is a step too. Anyway, we do it the old-fashioned way, sector by sector. Go over the whole peninsula, ask the locals, enter the places where we can enter first, like we did in the village. Then, if we're desperate, we can look where we can't enter. Bunkers, tomb drainage, this place, I'm sure it won't come to that. Walk the coast, the old boardwalk, the reeds. You can always come back here and talk to the wind again. Look where it already got you. An adventure awaits. An adventure on the windswept urban coast. Suddenly, there's a sigh, carried on the molecules around you, moving, flowing from high pressure to low pressure. Like that of a woman emptying her lungs. She wraps the collapsing stone box in front of you, in her breath, flowing through it. In through the collapsed roof, flowing down a concrete staircase to the basement, sweeping away footprints in the dust on the stairs, and then the beach below the boardwalk, its winding tunnels, a whisper away. She's down there. Okay, why? Good, good, yes. Cold spells. So basically your hangover is telling you she's down there? So, how do we get in there? The doors were on the collapsed side of this building. They're gone, basically. Finally, my time to shine. Perhaps you can climb them. We are not climbing anything. I'm 43 years old, and I plan to live to see 70. A rusty ladder leads to the rooftop. Some of the rungs are missing. Yeah, that doesn't look good at all. The distances between the remaining rungs are rather wide. You'd have to use the mounting brackets. However, they seem corroded, and the peeling rust is razor sharp. In addition, the first rung is going to be tough to reach. It's what, three meters above the ground, and you're 180? Not to mention that the roof is collapsing and the wind gets pretty brutal up there. Dismounting from the ladder is going to be hard. Perhaps if you were to not climb the ladder. Instead, what if you were to do something more subtle? What if you were to reconceptualize climbing the ladder? Astral projection. Be open-minded about this. Teleportation is not a thing. Okay, let's say teleportation is a thing. Wouldn't you need some kind of scientific apparatus to create a teleportation field? You can't just do it without apparatus. What are they talking about? 
Teleportation, Mikael. It's generally thought impossible. Oh yes, it could hurt a lot. He is restraining himself from using a parental tone with you right now. All you need to do is close your eyes and concentrate. Darkness enfolds you. You can feel the distance between the bench and the first rung of the ladder. All you need to is... Zoot! Zap! Pow! Crinkle! It's like magic. You feel yourself disappear. Your atoms fading out of existence. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Bam! You find yourself on the roof, having mastered the art of physical displacement. You know, for the record, you didn't teleport there. You just climbed the ladder with your eyes closed. The wind at the top of the building starts howling loudly, blowing away the lieutenant's voice. Faintly, you hear. Never mind. Find a way to let me in when you get inside. <sighs> Don't go adventuring with a backup, especially if we think the suspect may be hiding here. 